All right, all right. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm going to say right off the bat, it's, all I see is like your foreheads mostly. So um, I love to do things interactively. So if anybody has any questions, just raise up your hand, but make sure I can see your head because it's hard to see from here. Um, so my name's George Petro, and I make video games for a living. So I want to just thank you guys for letting me come and talk to you a little bit about what I do. You want this? Um, if you can't hear me, I'll... I was going to say, can you guys in the back here? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, right. I'll, I'll just... If you can, or whatever, let me know. Yeah, you, you guys let me know if you can't hear or something's wrong. Um, so uh, this is pretty much what I've done my entire career, is make video games. And I kind of want to go, if you, if you sort of indulge me here, go through a little bit about how I got started, um, what it takes to make a video game. And um, if you have any questions, I can certainly answer that. My, my hope in this presentation is that you guys get some insight, because what, what grade are you guys? Seven. Seventh, okay. Uh, my hope is that from seventh grade, you remember some of this, and if any of you are interested in the technology field or getting into video games, uh, some of this will be applicable. But certainly from a STEM perspective, m everything we do with video games um, is, is require STEM or, or the arts. So um, the type of video games that I make are these kind, right? The big kind, not, uh, has anybody ever seen any one of, the, any one of these games? Played them, right? You recognize some? Um, what I like to say about this picture, it only goes through 13. You know, we've obviously made more. Maybe you've played Jurassic Park out in the arcade. That's one of ours. In our company, we handle everything. So we think up the idea. I'll just give you a little slide of the stuff we do. We think up the idea, so we conceptualize what we want to do. Um, we go about the pro process of uh, not only scheduling the whole thing, but programming it um, in software, creating all the art, uh, licensing any um, assets that may be necessary, depending on what the property is. Uh, we also do all the electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. And then all of the, the items necessary to actually manufacture the game, like purchase all the parts, you know, handle the manufacturing part of it, and then the sales and marketing of the product. So we not only work from the technical aspect, uh, but all the way through the business aspect of, of the product. So um, you know, getting an arcade game together and uh, from your head all the way out into the world is no small task and it requires a lot of different people and a lot of different disciplines. Now in the office I work in, we're mostly concerned with design and creation of, of the title. So um, when we design and create, we obviously we use a lot, of, uh, a lot of technology to do that. And that's why I think it works a lot with the STEM initiative is because there's an awful lot of science, technology, and engineering that go into making games. Um, you know, a long time ago, they used to say that games were always kind of the ultimate test of the computer, of the computer's ability, because computers back in the day couldn't do much, and actually playing a game where it challenged a human was quite difficult. Uh, I still think that's true today, because the level of games that you play are quite intense, and the computer's doing a lot more than what it will be doing, saying, doing email or a spreadsheet, right? Those are easy, those are easy um, tasks for a computer. Rarely do you get into a situation where your computer starts to overheat because you're working on a spreadsheet, right? It's, it usually overheats because you got some mad graphics going and uh, can't handle it anymore. So that's what we try to do. We try to use the best and make, make really cool products. Um, this is a little, a little uh, picture of our manufacturing facility. You can see a whole bunch of different games. This, is a, this picture is a little old, but um, you know, that's right just outside of Chicago in Franklin Park. So we build all the um, we build all the games right here. Um, so from there, I want to go through some influences. I grew up in the '60s, '70s. Okay, so back then, um, maybe your parents have talked about this era of three channels on TV, no ability to record a show, things like that. We lived in the Stone Age of technology, but we did have rockets, and that was pretty cool. So we got a lot of chance to see some really interesting stuff happen. Does anybody know? what this represents here, this picture? Anybody? I know somebody knows about this. Eighth grade, you haven't figured this out yet? Come on. That's the Apollo missions, right? Where'd they go with this? Right, so you do know. Okay, so they end up going to the moon. As a kid, I thought this was pretty amazing, right? That we actually got guys to the moon. Um, 
and they used a lot of science and technology and stuff to do that. So during the 60s, this is what we were, we were looking at, and it really spoke to me. We also had this show come on TV. You don't need the title speaks for itself. But they did have the guy in the blue shirt. He was the science officer, and he was quite uh, another one that was quite a bit um, uh, important in, in my influence with like just the whole math and science thing. So back then, it took, this was basically what a computer looked like back in the 60s, right? It didn't do a whole lot. It didn't have uh, a whole lot of power. Certainly, what you have in your pocket uh, as a phone is just so much, so much more powerful, can store more than this whole room full of computers. Um, this computer was so not powerful that to get the guy to the moon, they didn't use it, right? What did they use to get a guy to the moon? Anybody have a guess? I'll show you a picture of it. Guess? Anybody? That's called, wow, you guys, you guys got some learning to do. Come on. Uh, that's called a slide roll. That's called a slide roll, right? So a slide roll was a, just a really primitive calculator, but it was good enough to get guys to the moon. Um, engineering has come a long way since the slide roll, okay? Um, but imagine with computers what can be done if they could get a guy, land the guy in the moon with just that, that stick that moves in the middle. Um, this also happened in the 1970s, another, uh, another big, um, big moment in my life. Um, this came out May 20th, 1975. Uh, I saw it that weekend and tw for 20 more weeks after that because we had to go to the movie theater to watch it. Um, and I think that this uh, probably, Star Wars probably influenced an awful lot of pop culture. And certainly it had a big influence when it came to computers. Um, and once you had a computer like the Apple, uh, you could do interesting things with it. You could get inside it, you could mess with it, and then you could create cool things like video games. So um, all of this influence of, of space and science all kind of culminated in this video game explosion. And this is what I got to see when I was a kid. And this kind of changed the trajectory of my thought process about where I would go in life. Um, and so I kind of pursued this, this whole passion of um, video games and what it took to make them because I had zero idea what it took. Um, I wish somebody would have come to my eighth grade class and told me how these worked because it would have saved me a whole lot of time um, because I had to dig in the back of them and read the manuals and do research, like go to the library and then go to college and all that stuff to learn how to make them. Um, but this is what I chose to do. And uh, I ended up coming up to Chicago to work um, in video games. And I worked at a company called Williams Electronics which uh, was in Chicago. They were making video games in the late 1970s and early 80s, also making pinball. Um, I came there to just got my foot in the door, and um, then I started uh, learning how to make, you know, what it took to make a video game. I, I got a chance to, you know, rub elbows with the programmers that were making these games and realizing that I had no clue what they were talking about. So um, luckily, during that time, I pretty much thought I was where I needed to be and wasn't going to go to college, but I got some great uh, advice from a man named Steve Kordak, who said, you absolutely go to college because you're going to learn things that you will not learn if you don't go there, and when you're young is the time to do it. So I ended up going to Indiana University and uh, trying to put together the best video game program I could, which they didn't really exist at the time, and came back after that to work at um, to work at Williams Electronics. And um, let me see if I've got that. I've got, oops, that was the game I was working on. I can't go back. Um, so we did a game called NARC that was, uh, was a uh, kind of the first of a, an evolution of games that led to the 90s Midway, which was Mortal Kombat and all those games. I'm sure everybody's heard of those. Um, so that was kind of our, my first uh, big break into video games. And again, that was, well, that says 1987, and we were working on it in the 80s, and it came out in 89. Um, I think, uh, anybody have any questions about that stuff, early years? I have a little video I'd like to show you that um, was produced about our company that tells a little more about where we went. Um, to kind of give you the story of what 
our company is now. Can you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> the arcade game Big Buck Hunter is celebrating its 10th anniversary, and needless to say, it still has a cult following. Every October, the world's top players come to Chicago for a world championship and shoot it out for nearly $50,000 in prizes. Big Buck Hunter has even attracted some famous fans. Chicago Bears Brian Urlacher and NASCAR's Travis Pastrana, who got into the game from fellow Scream Sports star Dave Zebra. He just kept hustling me and hustling me, so I went home, I bought Big Buck Hunter Pro, and the next time I came, I won $4,000 off him. So, so I, that was good. I made my money back on that one. Ever since, he's been hooked. I've been playing all the time. But I've been doing mine for 27 years now. The man behind Big Buck Hunter is play mechanic George Petro. He came up with the idea for a hunting game when his tiny Glen Ellen stardom was on the verge of shutting down. It just didn't go, then we just closed it down. It was that point. We put it out on the test, we had a point about the Aurora, and the first weekend it just you know, people would not leave it alone. Like other teenagers of his time, George Petro hung out in a local arcade in his hometown, Fort Wayne, Indiana, but he did not use it as a social center like his classmates. It was a place to fulfill a starry-eyed dream of working in the video game business. He shadowed the arcade's repairman, and once he left, convinced the owners to let him fix the game. He eventually caught the attention of an executive from Chicago-based Williams, who promised Petro a job. The day after high school graduation, he moved here. When they let me in Williams, it was like, you know, let the team in. So you ever see Willy Wonka, you know? That's what it was like to me. I would never leave. I mean, I would go through the factory, and I would look at all the tools, and I would look at, you know, all everything everybody was doing. And Petro continued working at Williams, now WMS, during summer breaks while attending Indiana University, and then after graduation got a permanent job in the Midway Games coin-op department. When Midway started to exit that business in the early 1990s, Petro decided to start his own firm. He could not take any other Midway employees with him, and it was tough to lure top talent. The biggest challenge was one virtually all entrepreneurs face, funding. Being a third party coin-op developer, third party meaning you're trying to sell your idea to other people to, to uh, manufacture, it was very difficult. It was very, you know, again, not having this funding stream, I was always worried about payroll every two weeks and how do we keep that going? And so, Big Buck Hunter was what eventually kept the doors open and eight versions and $120 million in sales later is Play Mechanic's most successful game. Now has a slot machine, an iPhone app, and a Nintendo Wii game through a licensing deal. As a third-party developer, Play Mechanic brought other titles, but they never achieved Buck Hunter's level of success and ended up making more money for other companies. So in 2006, Petro met up with his one-time hero and former Williams colleague, Eugene Jarvis, and talked about teaming up. I could have gone and talked to any number of guys with NDAs or business degrees or banks or anything, but nobody I didn't really want to work with somebody that was just an investor. That, that didn't really mean anything to me. I needed somebody that, that really understood the business and knew more about it than I did. And he was really the only guy out there that did. Jarvis's raw thrills and play mechanics merged, and since then, revenue has doubled to $42 million. Raw thrills focuses on the manufacturing, sales, and distribution of the game. Play mechanics, the design. The real test for us is really to go out there you know, with a pocket knife, a duct tape, and make something happen, you know, and with nothing. And I think that's the word George uh, and his play mechanics have really come up uh, from just just a dream and making it happen on a day to day basis. It's just an amazing business for them and their business where you don't have this huge safety net uh, to fall back on. The combined company now has a total of 70 employees. About a quarter of sales come from outside the United States. Petro has logged in a lot of miles lately trying to grow the business internationally. Play Mechanics released four new games this year, Terminator Salvation, Tip and Flop, Wheel of Fortune, and Big Buck World. And as long as there is a coin-op market, Petro says he'll be in it. But with games get smaller and more mobile, he thinks he realizes that there will be some game over someday. But when you innovate and you put talented people uh, to work with, they, you know, we don't know what it's going to look like. And that's the exciting part. That's always kind of what drives us is to be able to make cool products.
so she tells the story much better than I do. <laughs> tells my own story. A um, couple, couple interesting points about that video and the story is, you know, like I said, I worked for Williams Electronics in Midway, and then in 1995, I went and decided to start my own company. And there, like I said at the beginning of this, there's kind of two halves to this whole thing. There's the creating of the game, and then there's the whole business of getting the game made and getting it out there. Um, when I started my own company, I kind of, you get a chance to learn what you don't know, right? You, and you learn it the hard way. Um, I didn't know a lot about the business part, and that money thing was really a big deal. You know, when you're, when you're running a business, you have to have money. You have to have money to do all the things that you want to do. And as I like to say with making video games, you need money to keep the playground open, right? So we can play all day on making games. And, um, that's kind of what we, uh, was a huge challenge for me. And we were really talented at making games, but you have to have a great idea. And um, I, I would say that I'm not any different than anybody else. I don't really, you know, come up with ideas all the time, but, you know, I did come up with the hunting idea and it was a good one and it was timely because we were about ready, you know, to kind of give it up as a company after about five years. But, you know, literally over a weekend, thought up the idea, married it with all of the skill that we had of making games, and, you know, out came Big Buck Hunter, and, um, you know, it just really did well. We never know when we make a game how it's going to do until we put it out. That's kind of one of the, putting it out means put it out into the world and have you guys play it. Um, it's kind of funny when you make games, uh, it costs a lot of money. Somebody asked me a couple of sessions ago, how much does it cost to make one of our games? And you know, the answer to just create is about $4 million to make one game. And that's before we get into the manufacturing part of it. Um, so a long time ago, there was a company called Atari. Anybody ever hear of Atari? Yeah, right? So the guy who started Atari, his name's Nolan Bushnell, and he has a great quote. He says that it costs just as much money to make a bad game as it does a good game. So, you know, you might as well put in the effort to make it great. And... Um, it, it sounds easy and it sounds cliche, but it takes a lot of work to make something great. Um, and our games, along with $4 million, take about two years to make. So we have to make a lot of decisions every day about how this game is going to work. And if we make a wrong decision early on, that can sort of propagate its way to the end as a wrong decision. So over 34 years of making games, those are the kind of things you learn. So, you know... When you're young, when you're working on projects, make your decisions early that are good, and it helps out a lot, saves you a lot of pain. Um, so another, uh, another interesting thing I thought from the video, and I didn't really touch on this with the other classes, but I was just thinking about it, is that at the end of the thing, you know, there, there's talk about iPhone making arcade games extinct. Now, that, that video was probably made seven years ago, okay? So when I said on there that, you know, we just have to put talented people to it. You know, we're, we're seven years down the road now. And, you know, back then the iPhone was everything. Seven years ago, apps were blasting and they're like, oh, this is going to take over everything. Well, it's not necessarily the truth. Um, as a matter of fact, our industry is having a big upsurge right now because people are kind of tired of the iPhone. They want a more real experience for their entertainment. There's more money being spent out of the home. So um, we saw that. We've made some innovations there in the last seven years, and, and we're making products that are interesting. Um, who's been, has anybody been to a Dave & Buster's or main event lately? What, give me a game that you played that you thought was interesting. Oh, Buck Hunter. Did anybody see, has anybody seen the Space Invaders, the Giant Space Invaders, or the Giant Pac-Man? Have you seen that? The Giant Space Invaders? That's pretty cool, right? It's taken an old concept and putting, you know, we built this 10-foot screen out of LEDs, and it just, for some reason, people love that because you know what? Nobody's got a 10-foot LED screen in their house. And you can go for a dollar and sit in front of it and blast invaders, which is pretty fun. Um, so, you know, that kind of stuff is what we do. We're always thinking up, taking technology and, uh, you know, mashing it up different ways and seeing, seeing how we, uh, we can come up with something new. Anybody have any questions for me this far? No? Um, I'd like to take you through a couple things uh, couple pieces of technology and show you a little bit of how we do things. Um, let's see here. I want to show you a little bit of Big Buck Hunter 
in kind of um, sort of how it works. This is our engine. I can run our engine on this PC. So it's the actual game engine that's running. But I have it in a development mode, so I can just kind of go through the animals and pick what I want. load up a scene and we can kind of play with it a little bit. Okay, so let's watch this scene a little bit and see what's going on here. So this is the actual engine running. Those are all the animals. Um, you know, all the stuff was created at Play Mechanics. We got the bear this time again. All right, so um, in that scene, there's an awful lot of stuff going on. I turned it on right now where, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but it's tagging all the animals. It's kind of tagging all the different, uh, the different creatures that are alive in the world so the, the program knows what's going on. Um, I think I can. I have to restart it to do that. Um, hold on one second. Let's see if we can do it. See if this will do it. I'm not sure. There you go. Is that better? <laughs> Should have done that last time, huh? We're we're learning. We're learning. I don't do that. I don't do much of this. This is what all the, the creators do. Is that better? Okay, so, so let's take a look at what the world looks like. So this is kind of what the world looks like from a this is from a, a collision perspective. What's happening here is this is drawing out all of the the areas where things uh, collide with other things, but it also gives you a view of kind of how the world is built underneath. Um, this entire world is built out of triangles. So everything we do is built in these triangles and then we lay textures over the top of it. So I'm going to single step a little bit there because I like what I like personally is how the animals animate. So we have, we have all these animals running around, right? And they all have skeletons inside them. See the, you see the orange sticks? Those are all those are skeletons inside the animals, and those are those are how the animals are built. And then we have animators that literally move these creatures one frame at a time in order to make them animate. It does. That's why it takes two years. So here comes the bear. Let's get him to come up here. So this is kind of cool. So watch this. So see him stretch his arms out. So see those little balls. Each one of those balls is a joint. So um, at that joint, it can rotate any way you want it. So we have a tool called Maya that allows the animator to bring the bear up and then move each joint in, you know, in the right position to make him look like he's moving realistically. So the interesting thing about that is to have the talent and the practice and the skill to do something like that, you're just not going to do that. The guys that animate these, they go to college for four years and learn animation. And they spend all their time in practice doing it because it's very difficult. If I tried to animate that bear, it wouldn't look very good. Right. Yeah. Especially because we've only spent the last 10 weeks working on a code that you guys are still right. just getting to your summative project now. Yeah. So this is just a different language of code that they're using. Absolutely. So this is Mr. Bear. He's going to attack us. Now let's go back through this and turn some things off. And we're going to go ahead and uh, this time, oh, that didn't turn off. Why didn't it turn off? So this time, I'm going to activate it where I can shoot things. So I just shot him. But this bear is a little difficult, so I'm going to cheat with him. So 
so that's what happens when the bear dies. Um, so uh, if you look at the background here, this is kind of cool. This looks like a nice picturesque background with running water, uh, when in actuality, this doesn't exist. This isn't a movie. It's not video. This is just the engine creating, through mathematics, a lifelike scene. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things going on there to create that. That's a, that's a triangle mesh that has a texture map of water put on top of it, and then the mesh is being deformed and animated. Question? Oh, so, uh, and then there's reflections being put on top of it in a thing called specular highlights that make it flicker and everything. And that's, that's the vision of an artist that knows what a nature scene looks like, combining his art skill with technology to recreate that scene. Now we can do whatever we want in this scene. You saw the animals running through the water. We could have fish jumping in it or whatever. So that's Big Buck Hunter. Now I want to show you one other game that we have. Um, I'm going to show you a little video on it so you can understand what it is. It's a motorcycle racing game that we made. <laughs> So that is one of our, that's a property that we actually licensed. That MotoGP is a property that comes out of Spain. That's where, if you saw at the beginning of my presentation, I talked about licensing. We actually licensed the property. Some of the video there was the real race, and then some of it was our recreation of it. So we licensed it to um, recreate uh, as, a, you know, as a video game. going to run in the tool so we can mess with it a little bit. This one I have a little more control over than the buck hunter. I think I can use this control. Okay, let's look at this. So, so um, we can do the same thing here that we did in Buck Hunter. We can kind of look at this a little bit. 
so this one allows, allows us to draw the whole wireframe. So this is what the world actually looks like. So it's all these, it's just all these triangles. And so you can see the different levels of coding that you, you can show in there. Yes. The wireframes or you know, how things are developed one on top of another. Yeah, and that's one, that's one that I have here that I can show with MotoGP. It doesn't work so much in, uh, in Buck Hunter, but if I go through, um, one of these is, when we create all these graphics, there's all kinds of different um, buffers being laid over each other to make these graphical effects. Like, if we move through here, I'm, I'm switching on different buffers, and these are all combined. Like, see, there's the sparks buffer. You know, see how he's got sparks coming off him? That's a different rendering effect right there. And then this is a, this is called a normal map. Um, what this does, see how it's kind of weird colors? Those colors don't actually come through those are just uh, numbers, and they, they show up as colors to us, but how they show up in, in the final scene is, if you really look closely at these riders, they're, when you get up close to them, you'll see like their, um, their outfits have ribs and bumps and you know, signed on patches and stuff. We can't spend all of the time rendering the triangles that it would take to create such detail, so we create a rider that's not very high resolution, then we can add this other map on top of them that defines all these bumps, basically. And that's what that little map was. I can't imagine how many lines of code. I mean, these kids are working with 30 to 50 yeah. lines of code, you know, on what they're doing. And then you add that on top of that. Right, so I think, I want to say each scene, each, the rider, see this is a blur map. This is used to simulate, like, speed. So, the computer is always rendering this blur map that we can take as you speed up or do kind of uh, an effect. We can bring this blur map in and make him a little blurry to make it look like he's he's moving. If you look at, they call it motion blur. Has anybody ever heard that term? Mm -hmm. It makes it like, yeah, like in movies, in real scenes, you get motion blur. Well, in computers, you didn't get that for years. But once, once this technology called motion blur showed up, it made the computer uh, graphics, like if you watch a, a movie with computer graphics, it makes it much more realistic. So I think we have probably seven different, there's seven different maps that are laying over each other to make this rider. And they're all being mathematically combined as, as it goes on. So that's kind of what we do. Um, the biggest thing in, in finishing this up is, you know, we use every bit of science, technology, engineering, and math in what we do. Um, personally, I'm very science and math oriented, and that's how I, and, game, and I love games. So I took my love of games and also my love of science and math and combined them into a career <laughs> making games. And it's kind of interesting because when I was in high school, I was pretty good at math. I wasn't good at a lot of subjects, but math I was really good at. So I got advanced, uh, ended up taking calculus in high school and taking it for four years in college. Um, when you get there, calculus is very difficult. And I thought once I was out of college, I'd never see that again. You know, And lo and behold, if you, if you, when I was actually programming games, if you look at my desk to this day, right above my computer is a calculus book, because that stuff actually works. Like the math uh, that you learn, the physics that you will learn, and all those equations, they actually work. And we use them to create uh, real models in mathematics in these, in these games. And that's probably the most fascinating thing to me, is that none of this exists. It's all built off of theoretical or, or you know, some proven mathematics, and it actually builds a convincing world for us to play in. So any video game you play, there's an awful lot of math working behind there. Any questions on anything? Yes? Um, well, I used to, you know, program games and everything and design them, but now I just think them up, and then I have other people that do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many ideas, but actually, you know, there's a saying that uh, of any product is 1% uh, inspiration and 99% perspiration. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, ideas are kind of a dime a dozen, but actually working through the idea and making it real and making it right takes a lot of time. Like your robot that you're making, um, you know, the devil's in the details. How you get from one point to the other sounds like a great idea. Actually doing it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of trial and error. Um, and that's the 99%. So uh, let's give a round of applause.